Hello, History 72A, Winter Quarter 2024. We actually are starting to feel a little bit more like spring than winter here. That tells you that the end of the quarter is coming up and you need to check to make sure that you are on your way to the number of points that you want. Last time we looked a little at Spain at the time of North American and South American, for that matter, colonization by that country. Today, we will look at the way that gender and in particular ideas about reproductive labor, purity and pollution translated into a construction of race different to what we saw in the English colonies. In the last lecture, I set up the hierarchical categories that organized society in Spain as colonization of North America began and intensified. In this lecture, we will look at how hierarchies of power developed in Spanish North America. The categories of power in Spain influenced the ones in North America, but the opposite was also true. As systems of power developed in New Spain, they influenced Old Spain, but we will leave that for classes on Spain. As a quick refresher, Spanish society was organized according to an idea of lineage and inheritance linked to religion and carried in metaphysical blood or sangre. In the system developed in Spain, Catholics ranked above Jews and Muslims who were considered infidels and a source of corruption. Catholics came to be divided into two groups. Old Christians were supposedly descended from the original Spanish Catholics, and new Christians were defined as having a Jewish or an Islamic ancestor who converted to Catholicism. Power structures in Spain were deliberately structured so that they favored old Christians. In order to access the privileges that came with having a pure old Christian lineage, a Spaniard had to get a certificate or provenza proving their purity of blood or limpieza de sangre. Spain in the early 1500s stayed closely aligned with the Catholic Church during the Protestant Reformation. Spain also began building a government system that linked parts of Spain to the newly centralized government. Remember the unification of Spain. This means that Spain had a well-developed bureaucracy in place as they started intensively colonizing the American continents. This influenced their approach to colonization. The Spanish wanted and found resources in the Americas. Columbus vision of a Native American labor force extracting resources from American land for the benefit of Spain came true, just not in the Caribbean. The Spanish went through several ways of organizing and coercing Native American labor. I won't go into that part much, but I do want to look at the second goal on the slide. So I put two goals, Spanish goals in the Americas in the early 16th century, the 1500s. Resource extraction, for instance, gold, silver, using Native American labor wherever possible. And the second, building a society that encompassed both Spanish and Native American populations. Settlement colonialism with control rather than full replacement of local populations. The Spanish quickly formed another justification for colonization that would put both the power of the Catholic Church and Spain's well-developed bureaucracy to use. In the wake of the adventurers and conquerors, church officials, government bureaucrats, and colonists went from Spain to the Americas in quick succession. The Spanish government stayed involved throughout Spanish colonization, and Spanish colonization was started on a much larger scale than colonization by the French and English. You know something about the integration of religious conversion campaigns into Spanish colonization from our look at the Pueblo. 
Religious orders built missions from what is now the south and west of the U.S. down all the way through Central and South America. The map here is just Baja California to give you an idea of the density of Spanish missions. Again, this was not something completely independent of other aspects of Spanish settlement and colonialism, but at the heart of it. Government officials from Spain established Spanish-style town councils, municipalities, and judicial courts. The Spanish built or rebuilt, this on the slide is Mexico City, which was built over Tenochtitlan. The Spanish built these cities according to the Spanish urban grid plan, and you can see that really clearly on the slide here. The Spanish began surveying and parceling out land outside of cities. The Spanish also studied native languages and collected information on indigenous societies and histories. If you think about the adjustment or rewriting of history that occurred in the process of getting probanzas used to certify the purity of blood in Spain, you know that trying to figure out something like historical truth from records created by humans with an agenda or six in mind is a tricky business. Added to that, much of the information that we have on people in the Americas before the Spanish arrived was produced by the Spanish. We've considered this before with Columbus and the Taino in the Caribbean, as well as the Spanish and the Pueblo in what is now New Mexico. The Spanish state, at this point meaning both the crown, the monarchy, and its public institutions, deliberately or as deliberately as any massive endeavor guided from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean could be when wind and sails were the only means of crossing large bodies of water, the Spanish state intended to create a complete political, economic, and institutional framework in the so-called New World. The idea of the Spanish government was to create a governing framework made up of two spatially separate, but in all other ways, connected polities or republics. One republic was to be Spanish, the other was to be Native American. I've been using New Spain a bit loosely so far. You can see that the vice royalty of New Spain here in green, and you'll notice how much it covers of North America. And again, that's more wishful thinking than reality. And you can also see there's the vice royalty of New Granada and the vice royalty of Peru and the vice royalty of the Rio de la Plata. So the vice royalty of New Spain was only one of those, but it happens to be the one that concerns us. The two supposedly separate republics, Spanish and Native American, which would run through all of those vice royalties, they did not remain separate. And that will be part of our story in a bit. The overarching rationale for a separate Indian Republic rested on the idea that Native Americans could be and would be converted to Catholicism and that they would swear fealty to the King of Spain. From the perspective of Spain, this agreement to accept religious conversion and swear loyalty as the subject of a European king was a group thing. Not every Native American in the region had to agree, only enough, whatever enough was judged to be in the moment. In order to maintain their separate republic, the Native Americans had to stay faithful to the Catholic Church. And as many missionaries found to their discomfort, learning and performing the rules and rituals of the Catholic Church did not translate into actual conversion. And in cases when Native Americans did genuinely maintain their conversion, pre-Spanish systems of belief were woven into Catholic beliefs and practices, not completely abandoned. Native American villages were also required to pay tithes, T-I-T-H-E. A tithe is basically a tax that can be paid with agricultural produce 
usually one-tenth of the yield. While not everyone in a Native American village needed to convert, and sometimes conversion could be defined somewhat broadly, villages could not really get away with not paying the tithe and still maintain vassalage status with the King of Spain. We might wonder why maintaining vassalage status would be at all desirable from the perspective of Native Americans. At this point, the Spanish had established control over parts, albeit not all, of New Spain, and the colonizers were clearly by this point not planning to go away. If a Native American village in an area controlled by colonizers had enough Catholic conversions and people swearing loyalty to the Spanish king, and if they paid their tithes, legally they would get to retain their lands, keep most of their political autonomy, and keep their own internal hierarchies. This is an agave field that you are looking at here. The last one, hierarchies getting to maintain their own hierarchies, is the one we are most concerned with here. Strict segregation between the Spanish and Native American republics did not happen. I know you're shocked at that, but it just didn't happen. But social stratification did develop in both republics, and that stratification differed between Spanish-controlled regions and those Native American areas with at least partial autonomy. Laws and other features of local government also diverge. Meanwhile, Spain's inability to keep their own colonists and Native Americans strictly segregated meant that a certain percentage of the population would either be members of both republics, since they were mixed blood, or of neither. You know the Spanish obsession going into the early modern period with purity of blood and lineage. Members of the population with parents from different republics, Spanish and Native American, were not considered members of either. Often, Americans without Mexican ancestry think of Aztecs when they think of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. There were other Indian groups in what is now Mexico, each with their own internal structure of hierarchy, as well as hierarchical relations between groups, just as in North America. Spanish arrival and customs disrupted these systems, but aspects of them influenced hierarchies that formed in the so-called Indian Republic. Groups that particularly influenced new systems of government and power had previously had a system of nobility based on lineage and heritage. In other words, not all groups had that sort of organization, but those that did were based on what the Spanish recognized as blood. It did not matter that it was not the same as the Spanish purity of blood. It was similar enough for the two systems to influence one another. Disease, conquest, and heavy Spanish colonization pushed formerly dispersed Native American groups together into villages. Who survived and had influence in this process was not entirely random, but those are discussions for another class. Surprisingly, to me at least, the offer of autonomy that a village got by accepting vassalage to the Spanish monarchy was not completely or even mostly a lie. Within the so-called Indian Republic, Native Americans had the right to select their own leaders and to have their own land. This relative independence makes more sense if you think about the tithe system from earlier in this lecture. Organized, not particularly rebellious villages tended to be more productive with less effort on the part of the Spanish, so the Spanish kept their side of the bargain. Without getting into details, the combination of some surviving Native American rulers and nobles with the fact that Spain recognized these rulers and nobles early on meant that royal lineages became important in the Indian Republic. And because the ideas of the heritability of rank or of privileges being granted because of bloodline were similar between Spanish arrivals and surviving Native Americans, the sort of old, sort of new nobility that formed in the Indian Republic 
followed the rules of primogeniture. The development of the system was also facilitated by the reason Spain granted these Native Americans any autonomy at all. The Spaniards saw Native Americans as what they called soft wax, in the words of one Franciscan. In other words, they were easy to shape. The Spanish were committed to converting Native Americans to Catholicism. Remember that in Spain, conversos or new Christians were being viewed with distrust verging on hatred. The Inquisition was originally formed to hunt down crypto Jews and crypto Muslims. Why would the Spanish think? that Native Americans would not be exactly the same. The reasoning was that the Indians had not known about Christianity. Equally, Native Americans had also not been exposed to Islam or Judaism. The Native population was uncontaminated. The Native population could never be as great as the Spaniards in the eyes of the Spaniards involved in conversion projects, but Native Americans could be pure in the eyes of Spanish government as long as they did not mix their blood with anyone else's. These drawings on the slide were made in 1554. We have two properly clothed, in the eyes of the Spanish, Native American women innocently awaiting conversion if they have not been converted already. The one on the left is holding a flower in a properly ladylike manner. The one on the right is making chocolate. We now have people in New Spain with motivation to structure either reproduction or history or both to make their bloodline pure in some way. In Spain, purity was defined by having old Christian antecedents. In the Republic of Indians in New Spain, purity was defined by having uncontaminated Indian blood and by conversion to Catholicism. Reproductive strategies, meaning who you would choose to have children with, were also used to maintain the bloodlines of noble lineages among both groups, Spanish and Native American. For the European monarchy, when considering who was married off to whom, royal marriages were a part of diplomatic strategy because both ruling families and countries would be linked by blood. It is rather difficult to find pictures of Indian nobles in New Spain. So you have a man harvesting cochineal insects that were, and still are, turned into red dye. And these became especially popular in Europe once the Columbian Exchange, the exchange of plants and animals and diseases, had been started. Returning to bloodlines, what happened to the Spaniards who came to New Spain? Even more to the point, what about their children? Spanish colonists had to be examined and determined to have pure old Christian ancestry before they were allowed to settle in New Spain at all. In order to hold a high-ranking position in the government or church in New Spain, people also had to have a noble bloodline. But what about their children born in New Spain? You may recall that I asked a similar question about the English near the beginning of the last lecture. Were the children of two English parents, but the children born in the colonies, considered in the top most privileged exclusive category of whiteness? Our noble Spaniard here was governor and viceroy of New Spain in the 16th century. This is a picture and done by Spanish artists, and this is a picture done by Indian artists. The answer to the question of whether children born in the Americas to two European parents were fully white from the perspective of the English in England was decidedly no. Exposure to certain climates or distance from England would cause a person to degenerate. Whatever qualities defined true whiteness for the English would dissipate in English people who lived in the American colonies for long periods, and their children were even more likely to be a bit more degenerate, having never breathed the pure air of England at all. I am not being flip here. Well, okay, maybe my tone and delivery are a little bit flip, but I am not exaggerating at all. 
The Spanish of the same period shared many of the same ideas as the English. Spaniards in Spain felt that the American climate, environment, and skies made people lazy, unstable, and riddled with vices. Another description said that the children born in New Spain would mutate in temperament, habit, and corporeal qualities, becoming weak, thin, fragile, and lazy. Children born of Spaniards in New Spain were considered criollos or creoles. Creole has now taken on different meanings, but for the early modern English and Spanish alike, people born and raised in the Americas were always suspect, even if both of their parents were European. In addition to the climate, there was the question of whether true Spaniards could really trust the bloodlines of the criollos. Might they not be mixed with others? If you watch the coda to the last lecture, then you'll remember the albina is sort of a symbol of that, that kind of fear. This is a criollo on the left wooing an Indian woman on the right. Bloodlines related to birthplace took on new meanings and importance in New Spain. While Spain, the metropole or mother country, distrusted criollos and sent more certified pure old Christians to fill government positions, criollos descended from the early conquistadors felt that they had a special claim to land and power in New Spain, which was not entirely untrue with respect to Spanish law. In the Spanish system of rules, the original conquistadors and first generation of government officials had had been promised an elevated place for their lineage after them. These criollos descended from the generations that founded New Spain and not admixed here, also claimed, not altogether unreasonably, that they were bound to understand New Spain better than someone who had never seen it until well into adulthood. Here I've added to the criollo wooing the Native American a pure Spanish couple. Same series of drawings. To sum up so far, New Spain absorbed the overflow of Spanish bureaucracy. These bureaucrats were already accustomed to certifying purity of blood in Spain. They brought that system, petition, investigation, certification or not, to New Spain. Now there were three groups needing certification of purity, nobles of the Indian Republic, Criollos, who claimed original Spanish ancestry with no admixture, and old Christians directly from Spain. You can see a shift happening between purity of blood in Spain and purity of blood in the Americas. The Spanish in Spain worried about contamination from Jews and Muslims. The people of New Spain worried about admixture between Spanish and a whole host of other peoples. Just as in Old Spain, however, certificates of purity could be adjusted at different stages in the process of investigation. In the pursuit of purity certificates, both colonial Spanish and Native American history was adjusted to reflect new power structures. This went not only for individual lineages or blood lines, but for the bigger history created during this period. Before the Spanish arrived, there had been a variety of Native Americans in the region, not all of whom organized their government around royalty and noble lineages. But as power structures changed, so did things like creation stories and history to support the new power structures. To return to the two supposedly separate republics of New Spain, Spanish and Indian, each had their own set of rights and privileges. What would that mean for children who had parents from both republics? Even if you do not remember that I gave the answer earlier in this lecture, I would guess that you will have figured out that New Spain did not head in the dual passport direction. So it was in the interests of everyone to be able to demonstrate purity of blood to have access to at least one set of laws and privileges since you couldn't have both. 
but you could have neither. I mentioned briefly earlier that an application for probanza in Spain involved information for both the petitioner and his wife, although I did not stress the gendered nature of these petitions. Both sides needed to be pure, but it was the status of the father that mattered for the status of the child. New Spain was relying on records and memories from Old Spain, but also increasingly as years went by on records and memories created in New Spain. Initially, in New Spain, records of things like marriage and baptism focused mainly on the father because of patrilineal inheritance patterns. So, for example, on a marriage certificate in early New Spain, a groom might be identified as Espanol or India, but the bride, being largely irrelevant to property and title at that point, was not. When the issue became admixture and not just inheritance, however, that changed. Impurity was impurity, whether gotten from the mother or the father. And cases of illegitimacy, meaning a child was conceived and born outside of legal or legitimate marriage, was an irrevocable stain on the lineage. In order for noble men to maintain a noble lineage, their wives would need to be pure. Here, the idea of purity was starting to expand beyond, not instead of, but beyond purity of blood to include the sexual purity of women. Briefly, the end result was that if elite men in New Spain wanted to ensure an elite status for their children, then the men would have to control the sexuality of their, as they considered them, women. This could be supported by the intense record keeping related to lineage and bloodlines, but it would not be enough only to keep track of individuals with pure lines in order to be completely sure. Government and religious institutions started separate record books for people of mixed ancestry called Libros de Castas, or literally, Books of Breeds. Costa paintings would emerge from the power differentials and ideas about reproduction reflected in Libras de Castas. Here is a Spanish man and an Indian woman. Their child is a mestizo casta, or literally hybrid breed. Throughout this time, the population of people in the Americas with African ancestry began to increase, meaning that the issue of genealogies for the elite included more than just Indian-Spanish admixture. The Spanish already mistrusted people with African ancestry as part of the whole more equals, that's M-O-O-R, more, equals Islamic equals infidel equation. The image on the slide here from the 16th century shows Moriscos, or Spanish Moors, who had converted to Christianity. In addition to the Moor, M-O-O-R, Islam infidel linkage, African ancestry in Spanish America became associated with wider transatlantic developments. Although the English took over the transatlantic trade in enslaved people, they built on a system already set in motion by the Portuguese and in which the Spanish had been participating. The idea of African ancestry linked to enslavability was not unique to the English. The English used a discourse that already was developing to justify racialized chattel slavery. New Spain absorbed the idea of the so-called taint of slavery, but not the same racialized construction of heritable enslavement as the English. Many, if not most of the people of African ancestry in New Spain were not enslaved, but they were all touched by association of African ancestry with both religious contamination and increasingly with the low position of people who could be enslaved to such an extent. This painting labels the child of a Spanish man and a Black woman 
a mulatto, just as mestizo or mixed breed deliberately referenced animal husbandry or livestock breeding. The association of the word mulatto with mulo or mule was intentional, and it was derogatory, meaning it could refer to a person's background, but it could also be deployed on its own as an insult. I have been specifying that the father was Spanish in both of the paintings that you've seen so far today. In fact, I was not able to find a combination with a pure Indian father and a Spanish mother, although there are many of the reverse. Remember that in the Spanish construction of purity of blood for nobility, nobility could, after generations, overcome most of the impurity of non-noble blood. The essence of men was stronger than that of women, so male blood would ennoble a lineage in fewer generations, as long as there was no more admixture. If this makes you think of the system of humors with the blood semen link and the male having more metaphorical heat than the female, you are on the correct track. New Spain had a complicated system in which ancestry was gendered regardless of the sex of the person involved when it came to reproduction. This has the veneer or the covering of being systematic, but loses consistent logic with examination. Here goes. Spanish blood was stronger than any other blood. Spanish blood was coded male. So the combination of strength would be different for a Spanish father, strong, strong, and a Spanish mother, strong, weak. Indians of both sexes were coded female in the system. So a Spanish father, strong, strong, and an Indian mother, weak, weak, would be preferable to the reverse situation. An Indian father, weak, strong, and a Spanish mother, strong, but not enough to offset the male strength of the body category. You do not need to try to make sense of this. It was never applied consistently. And as with the situation in Spain, the Costa system both reflected and affected relations of power and privilege. There was no consistent internal logic to the system. For example, Spaniards of pure blood ranked above anyone else. So far, so good, at least in terms of logical consistency. Indians with pure blood ranked above Indians with mixed blood, but Indians with pure blood ranked below Indians with pure blood combined with high status Spanish blood. I love the smile on this kid's face. I'm not sure where its gaze is directed, but it's very cute. The Costa paintings did not reflect human variability on the ground, but they did reflect and influence the social construction of Costa and increasingly of race to return to relative strength of blood. African ancestry was coded male, but unlike Spanish and Indian blood, it could not be pure. So while masculine Spanish blood was cleansing, masculine African blood was polluting. The Costa paintings reflected stereotypes produced by those in power in order to keep their own power. This painting shows a mulatto man and a Spanish woman. He, having African ancestry, is shown as being ill-tempered and cruel. I don't know if you can tell, but he's holding a whip in his hand there. She is pure Spanish, but is also a woman with a lower status male. So she also is shown being slovenly or argumentative. And neither of them is paying attention to their child, who is identified as Morisco. Yes, the same word used a couple of centuries earlier in Spain to refer to Spanish Moors who converted to Christianity. A few big points here. The racial system that developed here was still inequitable. But unlike the English colonial system of black and white, in which any African ancestry was supposed to equal black and enslaved, 
The calculus here is much more complicated and much more immediately linked to the sex gender of parents. In reality, cases of applications for jobs or land or title and so on did not rest on the equations shown in the Costa paintings. They rested as they had in Spain's concept of old and new Christian blood on individual judgments and personal relationships. Free and Black were not mutually exclusive in the system of New Spain. Costas, or increasingly Rasas, were not equal, but the system was fluid and situational. It did not reflect the power dynamics or the hard binary associations of the English colonial system of race. This brings us back to the Martinez quote that I used in the last lecture, the first of this pair of Spanish-American lectures. The shifting meanings and uses of race simultaneously underscore its social constructedness and suggest that there is no single transhistorical racism, but rather different types of racisms, each produced by specific social and historical conditions. The historian's task is precisely to excavate its valences within particular cultural and temporal contexts and study the processes that enable its reproduction and analyze how it rearticulates or is reconstructed as social regimes change and histories unfold. Key points for Lecture 14. Although lineage and religion affected status in both England and Spain, they did so in different ways. Spain maintained an association with the Catholic Church and constructed Catholic as a category opposed to infidel, including Jews and Muslims. Associated with the Reconquista, hegemonic Catholic Spanish society constructed a distinction between old Christians, whose families had been Catholic for generations, and new Christians, which included recently converted Jews and Muslims, plus their descendants. Spain developed a system of petition, investigation, and certification, or not, in order to limit positions of power to old Christians. The reality of the certification process had at least as much to do with financial status and personal relationships as it did with past generations. The ideas of purity of blood, la pieza de sangre, and the certification of pure blood, probanzas, came with the Spanish to New Spain, as did the practice of gaming the system. In New Spain, however, new conflicts over power were reflected in the Costa system that developed. In addition to religious affiliation and time of conversion, one conflict involved a distinction between new arrivals from Spain and the descendants of original Spanish arrivals, and another conflict developed based on the continent or continents of ancestry, Europe, the Americas, and Africa. The proliferation of categories, for example, mestizo, morisco, reflected a complicated system with internal inconsistencies. For example, Indian ancestry could be pure if converted. Black ancestry could not be pure regardless of religious affiliation and duration. Sex, gender, and reproduction played a critical part in the construction of race in New Spain, but did not result in the strict binary constructed by the English colonists in North America. Categories such as race, sex, and lineage were and are not created in isolation, but with one another. The power of the reality of one category is dependent on the other categories. The constructions of race, sex, lineage in different colonies were based on some similarities between European powers colonizing North America at the same time and in competition with one another. 
but categories did not end up being constructed the same way, nor with the same levels of privilege and freedom in different colonies. Similarities of constructions result from similarities of starting situations, not from the inevitability of the resulting categories. Important reminder, socially constructed does not equal not real. The hierarchies and power differentials set up with the formation of categories of race, sex, gender, and lineage all had and continue to have real consequences. Once a system of categorization and hierarchy is set up, it tends to take on a life of its own. Power remains divided, but the rationale for that division changes over time. Time. The active rationale will reflect both historical and current power struggles. I am going to close this lecture with pictures of Costa paintings. Now that you have been thinking about the historical context needed to interpret them, think about analyzing the meanings encoded in each picture. Consider the text if you can enlarge it enough to see it, but even if you cannot see the text, you can interpret gesture and gaze, setting and clothing, and the way the child is placed and depicted in the picture. I went back and forth on this, but I have included some Costa representations that are blatantly and massively racist. They are after the third pair. This is the first pair if you want to avoid them. I have included them largely because while the paintings do violence in their depictions to lower status individuals, those people lower in the hierarchical system are depicted as the violent ones in the pictures. This is a pattern that we often see in American history, that those who actually receive violence from above are categorized as being a danger to people above. Most Costa paintings are generally happy families, although not all show the same degree of love between members of the family. I will end on a happy pair because history is depressing, and I want to remember that at least some real people did exchange loving glances.